Hey y'all! So I am back with a new Science Simplified for you guys. I've been so excited about all this neat research. So neat. I just had to make one joke. <laughs> uh, I listened to a webinar recently with James Krieger and Lyle McDonald, and the part that James did was on neat and just weight regulation. So I've always been interested in it, but in his talk he gave a bunch of really cool uh, sites. So of course I had to go look it up and I wanted to talk to you guys about it. I made a Facebook post a little bit ago about it, but it was, you know, you can only write so much, right? It, on Facebook wasn't like an article. So it was a long post, but I wanted to do a video on this because I thought that it very much warranted a science simplified video for you guys. So kind of like I did with one of the previous uh, videos that was a little bit longer, I am going to do part one is going to be the science and then part two is going to be the application. So this will be the science part of it. There's three actual studies that I'm going to talk about a little bit. So I have my notes. And because I want to make sure, of course, that I say everything properly. <laughs> uh, so if you see me looking down, that's what I'm looking at. And I will link the uh, notes below as far as the... In, I will link in the notes below the description for... Is it the notes or the description? Fuck. <laughs> Whatever. The thing in YouTube where you can paste things. <laughs> I will put the citation for these. So in case you guys want to look at them or order them, I can't remember if they're full text or not or if I just had them. Sorry. So the first one is written by Rosenbaum. He's an amazing researcher in this field. Definitely look him up if you're interested in anything with just metabolism in general. Uh, the long-term persistence of adaptive thermogenesis in subjects who have maintained a reduced body weight. Ooh. <laughs> so really cool paper. And so what they've seen in a lot of research is just post weight loss, energy expenditure, especially physical activity is lower than predicted values. So, what that means uh, in layman's terms is just, you know, you have your predicted metabolic rate and within that is different levels. So there is your total daily energy expenditure, TDEE, usually is how it's referred to as. And then there's different components. There is uh, your resting metabolic rate or your BMR. So RMR, BMR is what you'll see. Then there's TEF, which is the thermic effect of food. And then there is physical activity. So then there's the non-exercise acti activity thermogenesis, which is this neat component, or there's planned physical activity. So that's really what your metabolism is made up of. So in this, in most of the research, what they'll do is they will weight match subjects. So what you'll see a lot of times is like reduced obese people, so the, the reduced obese, um, or just like weight loss in general, you know, subjects. And then there's people who are the same weight, uh, but they haven't been dieting. So in this case, they were sex and weight match subjects. Um, and they were actually in an inpatient setting with a liquid diet. So everything was controlled. This is obviously not real world, but this is for this type of research, you're really gonna wanna have something like this that you can control 100% because you can tell people, oh, maintain your weight, but there's little fluctuations and that can really throw things off. So this is probably one of the best studies because it is an inpatient uh, setting. Of course, there's not a lot of these done because it's very expensive, <laughs> clearly, and many people don't want to sign up to sit in a little, like, chamber. I don't know if I, I'd probably do it just because I think I, I, it would be cool, but I understand why people don't want to do it. <laughs> so they had three different types of subjects. There was, uh, you know, they're just typical weight, so weight initial group. There was subjects who had maintained a greater than 10% weight loss for five to eight weeks, so that was weight loss recent, and then they had main people who had maintained greater than 10% weight loss for over a year. So that was weight loss sustained. Uh, and in all of, you know, through all the subjects, TEE, TDE, which is the total energy expenditure for the day, and NREE, which is non-resting energy expenditure, were significantly lower in the weight loss groups versus the initial group. Now, REE, which is resting energy expenditure, was also lower, but to a very small extent. So this was a highly, like I said, a highly controlled liquid diet um, and they maintained their body weight completely so they were at maintenance levels, um, which was good. So even though they were ingesting maintenance level calories, they, uh, you know, they measured everything and it wasn't matching up to what it should be. So regardless of time spent weight loss, like during the weight loss, whether it was a year maintained or five to eight weeks, both energy, like total daily energy expenditure and NREE was significantly lower. Um, NREE was where, or NEAT is where we saw the primary reduction in energy expenditure though. Um, so this really just suggests that you have to have a high level of physical activity um, in order to maintain your weight loss. And that is typically characteristic of people who maintain their weight loss for prolonged periods of time. So that is what this group found. And again, like I said, this is a super 
tightly regulated study, which is awesome. Uh, this next one was also a liquid diet, but it was uh, free living. This was a study done by Weigel. I might be pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> so they had, again, reduced obese versus weight-stable weight maintained controls who had not previously dieted. So there was 10 reduced obese people and 18 controls. This is super interesting, you guys. Of the six people in the reduced obese category, their RMR was 97.4 of percent of predicted, um, but 24 hour total EE was 75.7 percent of predicted. That's crazy. This suggests that most of the energy savings done by our body, or you know, energy savings or compensation, however you want to call it. Uh, is in this non-resting energy expenditure. So pretty much what they're showing with both of these groups is that your RMR or your, your just metabolism is not really gonna change that much uh, with weight loss and weight regain. Now, obviously there are people who do, but for the most part, that's pretty stable, plus or minus a little bit. The huge component that is changed is this NREE or just NEAT, we're just gonna go say that for ease of, <laughs> instead of saying all these letters so many times, NREE, I feel like NEAT is way easier to say. So. It's really fascinating to me. So that was a 75.7% of predicted. Now another group uh, that they looked at too, who had just sustained a 21.5% on average weight loss, which is a pretty good weight loss, showed a 71% reduction, again, in the you know that same component. That was 582 calories for, for those individuals. That's a lot, <laughs> that's a lot of calories per day. So again, this group similarly suggested that Substantial physical activity is necessary to monitor any weight loss and our bodies are a lot smarter than we want them to be And they're a lot lazier than we want them to be too. So in any kind of weight loss that is Endured your body wants to go right back to it. So you really uh, and subconsciously you're just you're bringing down this knee You don't even realize it um, a lot of people you know, like they, they're not even reporting that they're feeling like they're doing less. So sub, subconsciously, your body is moving around less, you're doing this less, right? And we've all experienced this if you've dieted before. Um, but these are even people who are maintaining the weight. So really, really interesting. Your body is a lot smarter than you think it is. Uh, and it's just something that two of these research papers have shown you need a substantial amount of physical activity in order to maintain your weight. Now this study by uh, Levine is a little bit different, but I think, or Levine, however you say it, uh, is, I'm Levine, uh, he didn't write this. <laughs> uh, the role of NEAT and resistance to fat gains. This is a little bit different, but same token, right? So they found that some people, and this is true in animals too, that NEAT a lot of times can be just genetic, and some people just move around more when they eat more or um, you know obviously move around less when they eat more so they took 16 non-obese individuals and they overfed them by a thousand calories per day for eight weeks which is a substantial I would say overfeeding um, two-thirds of the increase in their TDEE was due to increased NEAT crazy right and I have to read this word for word because I don't want to mess it up changes in NEAT accounted for a tenfold difference in fat storage that occurred and directly predicted resistance to fat gain with overfeeding. So essentially, the amount of NEAT that you have is directly, you know, correlated to how much fat gain you're going to have. So they looked at different components of, you know, obviously, you know, energy expenditure. So they looked at the BMR, RMR, whatever you want to write it. It increased about 5% in response to the overfeeding, so that's very, very minimal. And that only accounted for about 8% of the excess ingested energy. So really nothing. You're gonna see a little bit of an increase, but that's not really anything to write home about, right? Um, Postprandial post thermogenesis, or TEF, which is basically just what I talked about before, but just think about digestion, absorption, you know, storage of all of your food. That went up, they reported about 14%, but this was due to the greater food intake, and they there was no inter-individual inter -individual differences um, correlated with fat gain. So even though that did increase, there was no correlations with fat gain with the TEF. So RMR is out, TEF is out, they looked at NEAT, and that was the principal mediator of resistance to fat gain. So they also within, you know, there's physical activity, right? So there's NEAT, and then there is actual planned physical activity. So they controlled for that as best as they could. So they were looking at the biggest, they tried to look at that as like a, that's just a constant. And whereas the NEAT was something that, of course, people are doing spontaneously. So that was the principal um, mediator of the resistance to fat gain. And what was really interesting too was that this 
this value, like they, this predictive value had nothing to do with their baseline weight. Um, there was an increase in 300, about 336 calories per day, um, which again contributed to about two thirds the increase in TDEE. Now, interesting to note, of course, uh, that like I mentioned, there's some people who are more prone to this, uh, prone to fat gain because they don't move around as much versus others that do move around. So how interesting is this? The amount of NEAT varied negative 98 calories to 900, to, 692 calories per day. So really, really interesting, the range of people. Um, and this is very typical in obviously humans and also animals. Um, I believe probably more so humans, but there are people, they even, there was another study that I didn't read about, but I listened to in the webinar that James said that there were some people who were self-proclaimed couch potatoes and people who were just like, oh, I'm just lazy. And um, literally like half of the people were super active, just by neat, by default, by like fidgeting, by moving their hands, by moving around. Some people just literally live on the couch all day. So even people who are saying like, oh, I'm just, I don't do anything. Some people just naturally do more than others, uh, which I think, I just think this is so crazy. And I think there's a lot of, I mean, this is pretty strong research. Like these are just three papers that I just talked to you guys about in the fourth little snippet there. But there's a lot of research on this. And it's just something that I think that we all, as practitioners uh, need to be aware about and need to be talking to clients or just people that we interact with about. So that was the science portion of this, y'all. I will, like I said, in the whatever box in the YouTube, in the YouTube, <laughs> I will put the study links in case you guys want to read the whole thing. Uh, and then for the next video that I will release, that will be the more practical version and kind of my suggestions on how to increase NEAT in your daily life.